Hello, everybody. I'm Anthony Gonzalez. I am the program coordinator with the Higher Education Center for Alcohol and Drug Misuse Prevention and Recovery. I want to thank you all for joining us today for what we know will be a very informative session titled Alcohol Use Among LGBTQ Young Adults, General and Population Specific Influences, featuring Dr. Jessica Fish. But before we dive into the content, we do just have a few housekeeping slides I would like to review with you all. Here on your screen uh, should look similar to what you're seeing. We have entered into a Zoom webinar. Uh, through that bottom taskbar, you should have the ability to adjust the audio settings to your liking. So if you have any issues with the audio through the live session, this will be your first stop in trying to adjust or resolve that issue. Of course, if, you, if the issue continues, please feel free to reach out to myself or Logan Davis via the chat. Throughout the live session, we do encourage and welcome everybody to submit questions for our presenter. We do ask of you to drop your specific questions for our presenter in the Q&A. Uh, the chat, please introduce yourself, share where you're joining us from, uh, reflect on what is being present, uh, presented or re sharing resources. But if you do have specific questions for our presenter, please place them in the Q&A. We would also encourage folks to learn more about becoming a member of the Higher Education Center. And you can do so and learn more about the different members, uh, different membership tiers by visiting our website at hecaod.osu.edu. We'd also like to remind folks that the 2021 Virtual National Meeting registration is now open and the schedule is available on our website. Uh, the, the, natural, the national meeting will be taking place August 2nd through the 5th. And if you're interested in learning more, please visit our website again at hecaod.osu.edu. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today our presenter, Dr. Jessica Fish. Dr. Fish is a human development and family science scholar whose research focuses on health and well being of sexual and gender minorities and their families. Broadly, Dr. Fish studies the social culture, cultural and interpersonal factors that shape the development and health uh, the development and health of sexual and gender minority youth and adults. Her overreaching goal is to identify modifiable factors that contribute to sexual and gender minority health disparities in order to inform development, developmentally sensitive policies, programs, and prevention strategies that promote the health of sexual and gender minority people across the life course. Thank you so much, Dr. Fish, for joining us. And it's my pleasure turning it over to you at this time. Thank you so much, Anthony. I really appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who are joining on the West Coast, good morning. Um, and I just want to thank the organizers for inviting me to be here um, to, to speak with you all today about alcohol use among LGBTQ young adults. I'm going to be focusing uh, both on my own work as a researcher advocate, along with the research and advocacy work of others on the topic of alcohol use among LGBTQ people. Specifically, I want to situate the current talk with a background on the current evidence on sexual orientation and gender identity or SOGI identity related disparities in excessive alcohol use and alcohol use disorders. I'll then review some of the research highlighting the minority specific factors that drive, uh, that drive higher rates of excessive alcohol use among LGBTQ populations, followed by a discussion on some of the more emergent research on how normative mechanisms contribute to LGBTQ related alcohol use disparities. I'll then end by briefly reviewing some points related to treatment evidence and gaps. Um, it is important to acknowledge that uh, much of what of the research that I'm going to be presenting today is based on cisgender lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, so people whose gender identity, current gender identity matches their sex assigned at birth, um, lesbian, gay, and bisexual people, given that research on trans and non-binary populations continues to develop but has been limited given that many surveys have not, until very recently, included measures of gender identity, so that, that, that literature is still developing. That said, there's still much that we can glean from these studies of LGB people that extends, extends to, in part, experiences of trans and, gen and, and gender non-binary people with some exception. It is equally important to acknowledge the diversity that exists within the LGBTQ community, that LGBTQ identity intersects with many important social identities, such as race, ethnicity, religion, among others. So for now, I wanna acknowledge that diversity and that it does play an important role in the lived experiences of LGBTQ people and is related to their alcohol use. 
although research specific to these intersections is particularly lacking. Finally, I just want to note um, that I will be using acronyms such as SOGI for sexual orientation and gender identity, LGBTQ to refer to the general population and iterations therein, like LGB to refer to specific subpopulations. You'll also hear me use terms uh, like sexual minority to refer to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and other non-heterosexual people, and the term gender minority to refer to transgender, non-binary, and other non-cisgender people. They're kind of catch-all terms. Um, I'll do my best to define terms as I go through, but please feel free to drop clarifying questions in the Q&A in the chat, and I'll do my best to field them as I present. So let's start um, the discussion around LGBTQ populations and alcohol use. There is now a compelling body of research that showcases elevated rates of underage alcohol use, hazardous drinking, and alcohol use disorders among LGBTQ populations relative to heterosexual and cisgender peers. And uh, as we'll discuss in a bit, these disparities are present early in the life force, which uh, with many LGBTQ youth reporting earlier onset for alcohol use than their cisgender and heterosexual counterparts. At the same time, these disparities are not uniform for the population. And what we typically find is that disparities in alcohol use and alcohol use disorders are larger and more consistent among women than they are for men. In fact, many studies do not find alcohol use disparities between heterosexual and sexual minority men. And sometimes they typically find higher use among heterosexual than among sexual minority men. Most often alcohol use disparities are most pronounced among women, whereas substance use disparities, things like cocaine or methamphetamine and opioids are more pronounced among men. So for example, here's a figure of past month binge drinking among sexual minority and sexual majority adults from the 2015 National Survey of Drug Use and Health. You'll note the overall disparity at about 10%, but this difference is largely driven by women relative to men. And this pattern is pretty consistent across population-based studies of youth and adults. Research also finds larger differences in alcohol use when comparing heterosexual youth uh, and adults to bisexual peers than when comparing heterosexual people to gay and lesbian people. So generally research shows greater health burdens overall for bisexual people relative to gay and lesbians. And although limited, research is showing greater risk among transmasculine people and trans men relative to trans feminine people and trans women and non-binary people in the, in the instance of alcohol use. More recent research has also identified disparities in high intensity binge drinking between heterosexual and sexual minority youth and adults. For those who aren't familiar, high intensity binge drinking has really been identified through studies um, by Meg and Patrick and colleagues and reflects drinking at two and three, sometimes three times the traditional binge rate. So eight drinks for women, 10 drinks for men within a specified time period. This has been particularly relevant for those who work with young adults in collegiate contexts where heavy drinking is prevalent. This figure is from a study using US national data of high schoolers where we found that lesbian and bisexual girls reported greater standard and high intensity binge drinking relative to their peers, whereas bisexual boys showed elevated rates of high intensity binge drinking among boys. So for example, among girls, lesbian girls reported rates of high intensity binge drinking at three times the rate of heterosexual girls and bisexual girls reported rates over twice that rate. Importantly, as you all probably know, these heavy rates of use are associated both with acute and long-term health consequences. Other studies have demonstrated the developmental nature of these disparities. So for example, in one study, my colleague, Kara Exton and I, find incredibly dynamic age trends in rates of past year alcohol use disorder across groups defined by sexual identity and sex. This figure is uh, from using data from the National Epidemiologic Survey of alcohol and related conditions, which surveyed 36,000 US adults in 2012 and 2013. Here we estimated the prevalence of past year alcohol use disorder among LGB and heterosexual women and men by age on the X axis. Alcohol use disorder is defined as reporting two symptoms on the DSM-5 checklist for alcohol use disorder. What we find, which is particularly relevant for this group, is that sexual orientation differences in alcohol use disorder are largest for those in their early 20s. So this is not uncommon, right? That we see young, that we see young adults as having higher rates of excessive alcohol use and alcohol use disorders. But the disparity is really what I wanna draw your attention to where 45 or one in two, 45% uh, of gay and bisexual men and 35% of lesbian, gay and bisexual women meet the criteria for an alcohol use disorder in the previous year. 
So these findings suggest that although studies continue to document, document elevated rates of alcohol use disorder among sexual minorities, age stratification illuminates points in the life course where risk is particularly high and may be prime opportunities for screening and prevention and intervention. So population-based data on alcohol use and quite frankly, other health indicators among trans youth have been limited. In fact, the first population-based study of trans youth health didn't get published until 2017. The most recent iteration of the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is a national survey of middle and high school students around the country found perhaps unsurprisingly, stark differences between cisgender and transgender youth with regard to suicidal ideation, behavior and depression, as well as marijuana, alcohol use, and cigarette use. And these differences at the population level have been found in statewide data from California, Minnesota, and Colorado. And still, the research among transgender adults are more mixed, with some data findings um, higher rates of alcohol use disparities and alcohol use rel relative to cisgender peers, uh, whereas others do not find differences in alcohol use across uh, gender identity groups. Although this lack of difference may be more related to the design of studies than to actual no differences. Apologies for my cat. <clears throat> Current research also illustrates that sexual orientation and gender identity disparities are present at very young ages. These figures are from a recent study I conducted with colleagues where we tested age-related differences in alcohol use and heavy episodic binge drinking among heterosexual and sexual minority youth from ages eight from 12 to 18. This sample reflects a statewide population-based sample of middle and high school students from the state of California in 2015 and 2017. You'll note that disparities are present by age 12 and persist and appear to accelerate across adolescence, particularly among sexual minority girls, which are represented by the top line with the triangle. We also tested these differences across gender identity and saw similar trends whereby transgender youth reported much higher rates of alcohol use relative to cisgender boys and girls. <clears throat> Excuse me, again, these disparities were already present by the age of 12. And here you also see some acceleration of the difference across ages. We know that early and frequent alcohol use in adolescence is associated with risk for long-term use and disordered use later in the life course. A study by Megan Schuler that was recently published showed that sexual orientation disparities and alcohol use disorder in adulthood were actually largely explained by this early onset feature that we're seeing here. Therefore, these early disparities are concerning given the potentials for long-term risk for alcohol use disorder and related comorbidity. Um, it also showcases why you might note increased use among LGBTQ college students and that these disparities and experiences are already present by the time they end up in college and might warrant strategic initiatives for screening and intervention for these populations in collegiate health and mental health services. They are already coming in with these disparities. So screening and intervention is just as relevant, if not more than prevention strategies. Researchers and practitioners often use the minority stress theory to help understand elevated risk for suicide, substance use, and poor mental health among LGBTQ populations. Specifically, minority stress theory explains that in addition to everyday stressors that influence mental health, LGBTQ people by virtue of having a stigmatized sexual and or gender identity experience unique stressors. These include external and enacted stigma such as discrimination, harassment, rejection and victimization, but also internal stressors that stem from these experiences of discrimination and harassment. These include internalized homophobia, transphobia, hypervigilance, expectations of rejections, the need to conceal, all of which compound everyday stressors to influence poor mental health and greater substance use. Now these stressors can be acute, such as getting kicked out of one's home after disclosing an LGBTQ identity or being the victim of a hate crime, but they are often more subtle and chronic to just having to consider concealing or coming out to doctors, counselors, and neighbors, or altering your behavior in certain contexts to eliminate being outed. Excuse me. Um, so acting more masculine or feminine in certain situations, um, or you might experience subtle cues uh, in your everyday life. I'm so sorry. Give me one second. <laughs> the joys of working from home. Um, okay. So, um, 
this oftentimes so the subtle form is is a chronic form of minority stress are very commonplace for LGBTQ people are incredibly detrimental to the health and well being for this population. A lot of times people think about these like microaggressions, right? These slow cuts that add up over time. So that said, many people are at a point where they're saying, but it's different now, right? Like, think, aren't things getting better for the LGBTQ population? And it's true in some ways. We reflect on the arc of social change for LGBTQ rights. Few societal attitudes and opinions have changed as quickly as those regarding LGB and to a lesser extent, transgender people and rights. In the period of less than one generation, we have gone from almost complete silence and invisibility prior to the 1960s to greater legal and social acceptance only half a century later. Large scale social surveys, including the general social survey, the Pew Daily tracking survey and the Gallup poll show that attitudes towards same sex people and their relationships have steadily improved in the last 40 years. We also have witnessed the repeal of harmful policies such as don't ask, don't tell and the enactment of laws that provide protections for LGBTQ people and their families such as marriage equality. And the visibility of LGBTQ people in mainstream culture, media and politics provide additional evidence for how much things have changed with regard to LGBT people and communities. So for example, this is um, the general social survey is a US nationally representative survey that monitors trends and opinions been tracking attitudes towards LGB people since the early 1970s. And this particular line here represents the decline among people in the United States who believe that LGB people, or as they term it, homosexual people, should not be allowed to teach adults in a university setting. So this kind of just is a, a moniker to reflect broader social attitudinal changes. And these changing attitudes, along with increased visibility of LGBTQ people, provide a historically new possibility. And that's to be out as a teenager. So these data points reflect the average age of coming out or disclosing one's non-heterosexual sexual identity to family and or friends in studies dating back to 1979. An overview of these studies reflect an appreciable and steady decline in the age at which youth come out as LGB. Similar studies also show this effect among transgender youth. It's safe to say that changing social attitudes and visibility now afford youth the ability to understand themselves as LGBTQ at earlier ages at a stage in the life course when sexuality and identity are core tasks of development. And thanks to visibility and access to the internet, they now have the language to understand and define these diverse sexual orientation, gender identities and expressions. And as more youth come out, many presume that the mental health vulnerabilities that have been documented among LGBTQ people in research may ultimately be overcome in younger cohorts of LGBTQ youth, so young people today. That is that new legal and social acceptance might present new pathways towards health and wellness for contemporary cohorts of LGBTQ people. Put simply that things are better now. But this conclusion actually hasn't been found in the data. Instead, a paradox emerges when comparing the arc of social change to the health status of contemporary LGBTQ adolescents. In fact, my colleague, Dr. Dr. Stephen Russell and I argue that the intersection between changing social norms and the declining age of coming out have created a collision between normative adolescent developmental processes on the one hand and individual development for LGBTQ people on the other. Specifically, as more LGBTQ people, youth come out in early adolescence, they navigate cognitive, interpersonal, institutional, and social cultural contexts in which LGBTQ identities and issues may be particularly complex. <clears throat> So what do I mean by this? Well, with the onset of puberty, you've become aware of same-sex attraction and different, differing gender identities and expressions. And this occurs at a time when youth are particularly vulnerable to peer attitudes, influence, and victimization. Peers and peer approval matter so much to the self-esteem, well-being, and self-concept of young adolescents more than any other time in the life course. Peer expectations and policing of quote unquote normal sex, gender, and sexuality are also incredibly strong during early adolescence. And youth are often socially sanctioned if they violate traditional gender sexuality norms at this age group. Youth at this time are also still actively developing uh, understandings of empathy and ethical moral reasoning, which leads them to perpetuate victimization and bullying at higher rates than at any other developmental stage. There is in fact a lot of research showing that victimization peaks in early adolescence and declines as youth age, although this is not the case for LGBTQ adolescents. And unlike the generations before them, LGBTQ youth today come out at a time when they are financially and emotionally dependent on family 
and required to attend school. Whereas prior generations of LGBTQ people would often wait until they were out of school and financially independent from family or living outside of their home, providing them with more resources for coping in instances of rejection and cutoff. And so my colleagues and I argue that with improved social attitudes, LGBTQ youth feel okay to come out, but then are uniquely vulnerable to peers and family who may not accept them in context that they cannot leave. And this is supported by research that demonstrates who youth who come out are more susceptible to experiences of peer victimization, family rejection, and family harassment and abuse than youth who conceal these identities. In other words, these broader socio-historical processes of growing acceptance, with some exception, and improved policies now collide uh, with uh, normative developmental processes in ways that make contemporary LGBTQ youth vulnerable to poor mental health and substance use, just like the generations before them. I want to be clear, I'm not saying that LGBTQ youth should not come out. In fact, even with increased victimization and harassment, there's research that shows that youth benefit from disclosing their LGBTQ identity. Instead, I'm drawing attention to the fact that youth are now coming out in contexts that have not adapted to the degree necessary to support them and their positive development. <clears throat> you might be wondering the relevance of this developmental perspective that I'm presenting for LGBTQ college students, but my take is that it's important to consider the context in which your current and upcoming cohorts of students grew up in and how this context shapes their alcohol and substance use. It's a both and. We have experienced enormous social change and youth are still experiencing stigma in ways that drive disparities in mental health and alcohol use at a critical time in the life force. So let's take a look at some of the recent trend studies to kind of make this more concrete. So these figures are from a trend analysis that me and my colleague Laura Bombs conducted looking at alcohol use among LGB students using the National Youth Risk Behavior Survey. Data from 2007 are reflected in the dark green, data uh, from 2015 in the light green, um, and they represent the prevalence rates of lifetime and past 30 day alcohol use and past 30 day heavy episodic binge drinking for boys and girls respectively. When comparing the two years, it's immediately apparent that there are promising declines in alcohol use among youth from 2007 and 2015, which supports finding in other studies on trends of substance use, such as monitoring the future. However, when we stratify these results by sexual orientation, what we find is that the rate of decline across the two time points is less robust and consistent for sexual minority youth relative to heterosexual youth. The asterisk next to each subgroup denotes statistical declines in the prevalence of alcohol use across the two time points within each group. So for heterosexual boys, you'll note a statistical decline in rates of lifetime use from 2007 to 2015. And when we look across all sexual identity subgroups, you'll note that only heterosexual youth report consistent statistical declines in all indicators across the two time points. <clears throat> Although we did note statistical declines for bisexual boys and girls in two of the three indicators, gay, lesbian, and unsure youth did not evidence statistical declines in alcohol use um, across the period. And these same patterns of relative stability and these disparities are also present in a study that we did on cigarette use using the YRBS. These figures reflect the prevalence of lifetime cigarette use from 2005 to 2015. Again, we see the same overall pattern of decline across all of the groups, but note that the gap between heterosexual and sexual minority subgroups of youth remains statistically stable over time. And we have replicated these studies using representative school-based data from British Columbia, Canada, a context presumably more favorable to LGB youth. And others have shown that these same patterns of stability are also present <clears throat> in markers of mental health, suicidality, and known mechanisms of sexual minority health disparities, including victimization, bullying, and parental support. <clears throat> Overwhelmingly, these papers suggest an alarming degree of stability, and in some cases, a widening disparity of sexual orientation differences in substance use, mental health, and mechanisms from the late 90s to today. And although we sometimes see uh, narrowing disparities, these patterns are not consistent or are more attributed to a specific data source. So most importantly, these studies really are emphasizing that the social determinants of LGBTQ substance use uh, are remaining. So these issues of development um, and the developmental collision that I'm presenting are also critical to consider when we observe that, in addition to coming out earlier, more youth are understanding themselves to be sexually and gender diverse than ever before. <clears throat> Many of you likely saw the news headlines a few months ago where the, uh, the Gallup poll found that one in six youth in Generation Z 
identify as LGBTQ. In fact, when you look at the change across generations, the trend is fairly pronounced. With each generation, more people identify as LGBTQ, and the most recent generations, Generation X, Millennials, and Generation Z, we see an acceleration in the number of people who understand themselves as LGBTQ as they age, particularly post-marriage equality. With the most recent, um, up at the top there for Generation Z, 16% identifying as LGBTQ. And what about today's generation, the generation coming up now? Uh, in Generation Alpha, we find similar, if not even higher numbers of LGBTQ representation. Here are the data from the most recent National Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which is fielded by the CDC. It finds that 3.4% of youth identify as either transgender or questioning, and 15.7% identify as LGB or questioning their sexuality. So if the point hasn't already been implied, these data reflect current and upcoming cohorts of students who are attending your and our universities and colleges and reflect uh, a cohort raised in a time of both high visibility, but also stigma and the health consequences of that stigma. And so this model still holds. And as LGBTQ college students traverse university settings, their earlier experiences with stigma shape the influence and influence their vulnerability for alcohol use in the university context. Um, the stressors of college can further compound this process, especially for those who are still trying to navigate and understand their LGBTQ identity and seek out supports that affirm that identity in their process. However, stigma is only part of the story. Although sexual minority stress undoubtedly plays a role in alcohol-related disparities, the literature has been criticized for inattention to developmental and social factors that may also contribute to increased substance use among sexual minorities. I'm gonna talk about a few of these mechanisms, many of which are documented very well in a recent systematic review by uh, Boyle and colleagues um, published in 2020 on the normative mechanisms implicated in sexual orientation related disparities in substance use. So these include alcohol norms, social and contextual factors, motivations and expectations, attitudes and perceived harms, and childhood victimization and ACEs. Many of you may be familiar with social psychological perspectives of alcohol use norms, which relate to the various normative influences of alcohol use. And it's typically conceptualized at three levels of analysis. Perceived norms or a person's perceptions of behavioral and attitudinal norms in their peer group, which often guide their future behavior. Within that, there are prescriptive norms, which reflect people's perceptions of how much alcohol their peers use, and their injunctive norms, which refer to a person's perceptions of whether their own alcohol use behaviors are approved of or deemed acceptable by their own peers. And these norms, as many of you probably know, are strongly linked to alcohol use in the general population. And these perceptions, are in contrast to actual norms or the actual amount that their peers are using in everyday situations. And the distance between these perceptions and the actual norms um, is related to the discrepancy between what they think they see in real life and what is actually happening. Um, whereby people often overestimate the degree to which their peers are using alcohol and approve of alcohol, um, which oftentimes guides their own drinking behaviors. So in the context of LGBTQ populations, research has actually found that LGB college students tend to perceive that their peers consume more alcohol than do heterosexual college students. So they think that their peers are using alcohol more often than they actually are when compared to heterosexual peers. And one study found uh, that these elevated perceptions of alcohol use were strongly related to LGB students' own alcohol use and actually partially explain disparities in alcohol use between heterosexual and sexual minority college students. So the more these LGB students perceived that their peers used, the more likely they were to use. And that in part explained the disparity that they were seeing at this one college. Other studies have also found that LGB women are more likely to perceive greater use among other LGB women than to heterosexual women. And this elevated perception of use was strongly related to their own alcohol use. Oh, excuse me. Interestingly, they found that perceptions of other LGB women's use was actually a much stronger predictor of alcohol use among sexual minority than their perceptions of how much alcohol heterosexual women were using. 
So their in-group status with other and their perceptions of other LGB women were strongly driving their own behaviors around alcohol use. And so one potential strategy to address these disparities is to help normalize the actual amount of alcohol use that LGB peers are using in social contexts, like at universities and other settings. And actually there's a great randomized control trial going on right now that's doing just that. Um, social and contextual factors also influence use and there's evidence to support this for LGBTQ alcohol use. Several studies, for example, highlight the greater LGBTQ community affiliation and participation, so participating in LGBTQ related events, LGB saturation of personal networks, so more LGBTQ people in your personal network, and engaging in LGBTQ related events and venues, such as bars, are related to increased alcohol use, which is probably not surprising, but a relevant point to make. Other studies have also shown that LGB people perceive attendance and engagement with bars and clubs as more normative than heterosexual people. So for example, one study found that compared to 15% of heterosexual women, 30% of lesbian and bisexual women reported visiting a bar in the previous month. <clears throat> this is likely a vestige of, of gay bar culture from the 1950s and 60s that has carried forward where many LGBTQ events and gatherings are situated in LGBTQ affirmative spaces, which typically and historically have been bars and clubs. For many, this is also some of the only ways to guarantee meeting LGBTQ peers and a potential dating partner. So it's just a, more engagement in these spaces for LGBTQ people. Many of you are also likely familiar with theories related to motivations and expectations of alcohol use. Much like the general population, LGBTQ people who report drinking to cope with stress are more likely to engage in excessive alcohol use and have an alcohol use disorder. Some studies among youth also find that LGBTQ youth who report drinking to fit in are more likely to engage in alcohol use, even relative to their heterosexual peers. It's a stronger link between those factors. Other studies find that sexual minorities discuss how they use alcohol use as a social lubricant to engage specifically in LGBTQ related events. And so you can kind of see here that motivations and expectations are complicated by stigma and internalized homophobia and transphobia. So I was doing a qualitative study a couple of years ago and a lot of the narratives that, that we were hearing from these folks is that some of their first initiations within the LGBTQ community was facilitated by alcohol use or with the same sex partner was facilitated by alcohol use due to stigma and shame or uneasiness. Um, other LGBTQ people also discuss their motivations to engage in bars and drinking to meet people and partners, and that they see it as part of their socialization and engagement with the LGBTQ community. Oftentimes when uh, young adults are coming out for the first time, the first thing their friends do is take them to the gay bar, right? So it's a part of this socialization process. Although less studied, it's worth mentioning that studies have shown that sexual minorities tend to have more accepting attitudes towards heavy drinking relative to heterosexual people. So they're more permissive towards it. And more recent research has found that sexual minority and transgender youth also perceive alcohol and substance use to be less harmful to their health, which partially explains disparities in use. So their general attitudes and views towards alcohol use and in the second study, substance use is just more favorable and likely guides their own behavior with alcohol and substances. Finally, abuse, violence, and victimization are considered major life stressors and are consistently linked with long-term adverse consequences, including hazardous drinking and alcohol use disorder. Sexual minority men and women are increased risk for childhood sexual abuse compared to their heterosexual counterparts, thereby further increasing their risk of developing alcohol-related problems. Um, in the example presented here on the slide, Hughes and colleagues analyzed data from a national sample of adults Results supported findings from previous studies suggesting that sexual minority women and men are at higher risk for childhood victimization than their heterosexual counterparts. Lesbian and bisexual women were more than twice as likely than heterosexual women to report any lifetime victimization. And lesbian, gay men, and bisexual women uh, also reported greater numbers of victimization experiences. Importantly, women who reported two or more victimization experiences had two to four times the odds of alcohol dependence and drug use disorders as women who reported no victimization experiences. And lesbians who reported childhood neglect had more than 30 times the odds of alcohol dependence as heterosexual women who themselves reported neglect. So you can kind of see how these disparities are compounding. In contrast, although gay men were significantly more likely than heterosexual men 
to experience forms of victimization. For some reason in this particular sample, the differences uh, did not increase uh, gay men's risk of substance use disorders. So you can see how these facets, including norms, LGBTQ culture and community, personal experiences and expectations converge to influence alcohol use among LGBTQ young adults and how these normative factors are complicated by stigma and stress. So part of addressing LGBTQ alcohol use, therefore, is specific to exploring the unique experiences of LGBTQ people uh, and stigma on the one hand, but also to consider how the community and perceptions of community influence people's own beliefs and behaviors about alcohol use. So again, a both and. So with that, I just wanna spend a few minutes uh, jumping into uh, discussing some treatment evidence and gaps for LGBTQ people. Spoiler alert, there's not that much out there. This is an area that needs a lot of work. Um, given the unique needs of LGBTQ people seeking treatment, there is a mounting case for offering LGBTQ specific treatment strategies. So for example, John Pachankis had a randomized control trial that he published a few years ago that demonstrated that LGBTQ adapted cognitive behavioral therapy therapy that specifically addressed identity and stigma, um, reduced depression, anxiety, and alcohol use problems, more than weightless controls. There's also qualitative evidence about lower levels of satisfaction among LGBTQ clients in quote unquote traditional substance use programs that do not address LGBTQ experiences and stressors. They also report better outcomes for LGBTQ people in LGBTQ specific programs and that LGBTQ people are more likely to persist in treatment when it is sensitive to LGBTQ issues. <clears throat> so you can see how this incorporation of LGBTQ sensitivity is really critical for treatment adherence, um, persistence, and success. <clears throat> Unfortunately, many programs and treatment approaches do not consider or incorporate LGBTQ specific factors. In fact, many providers and programs lack LGBTQ related sensitivities in their care. In a national study of mental health and substance use service facilities that I did with a graduate student of mine, Tasha Williams, we found that only 12.5% of national mental health facilities and 17.6% of national substance treatment facilities offered any LGBTQ specific services. In that same study, we were also interested in how the presence of these LGBTQ specific resources match the population density of LGBTQ people in the United States. So for example, in areas where there's more LGBTQ people, were we more likely to find these LGBTQ specific resources for treatment? Um, fortunately, we did find that the percentage of LGBTQ people in a given state was positively associated with the number of mental health facilities Unfortunately for substance use, we did not see that relationship in these factors. So we don't see that in areas where there's more LGBTQ people that we also see LGBTQ specific substance use treatment services, <clears throat> which is a gap. So given the increasing number of LGBTQ people in the US population, specifically younger people, and the continued presence of LGBTQ related disparities in alcohol use and misuse, I wanted to offer some considerations for treatment and programs. So these include assessing, so asking the question and knowing who's in the room with you, acknowledging and understanding LGBTQ populations and their experiences, specifically around stigma, trauma, and its relationship with alcohol use. Being willing to explore LGBTQ related stigma, support and community connection and how these are both resources, but may also perpetuate and influence alcohol use in both positive and negative ways. Examining students' prescriptive and injunctive norms, social environments, their motivations and attitudes of alcohol use, and how you might try to normalize and address discrepancies in these norms and expectations, and discuss on how their environments and motivations for use um, might be perpetuating their use in potentially problematic ways, even if these same environments, for example, provide support for LGBTQ people. And many of you likely already know this, but be prepared to discuss and assess for childhood victimization, family rejection and neglect, and other ACEs um, of adverse childhood experiences as they contribute to alcohol misuse and disorders later in the life course. Generally, it is just important to acknowledge how LGBTQ identity plays a role in the lives of your students, while not overemphasizing or over attributing behaviors and experiences to these specific identities. So this can be a tension uh, oftentimes for therapists working with this um, population who they themselves don't identify with this population 
but generally this tension gets easier the more you educate yourself in the community. Given the current context, I would be remiss not to at least mention, spend a few minutes talking about some of the work that we've been doing in the area of LGBTQ college students in COVID-19. The start of the pandemic, I worked with a student group in our School of Public Health, and they were really motivated to do a college survey on LGBTQ college students and their experiences during the pandemic. And we fielded a national non-probability survey of LGBTQ college students and their experiences during the early months of the pandemic. What we found was that there was definitely unique experiences for LGBTQ young people during the pandemic. So of course, everyone was feeling isolated at home. There was a lot of stress around the pandemic, but for LGBTQ students in particular, they reported feelings of, of, of great disconnect from LGBTQ communities and supports, limited access to LGBTQ affirmative spaces and services, even if they were tel uh, like um, telehealth or remote, they felt uncomfortable talking about those things in their own home rejection and hostility from accepting family members, and many reported feeling, quote unquote, recloseted at home after being out at school. Either they had not already told their parents and were coming home and having to hide that, or they had told their parents and their parents were not necessarily accepting or even sometimes hostile towards that part of who they were. Importantly, these experiences were associated with changes in mental health and subsequently the substance use, uh, their own substance use during the pandemic. So we, one of John Salerno, who's a graduate student I work with, did a study where they looked at how the pandemic was related to increases in psychological distress and how those specific increases were also related to increases in alcohol use, marijuana use, and cigarette use. Um, we also found that LGBTQ students who moved in with their parents during the pandemic had greater increases in psychological distress than those LGBTQ students who stayed where they were, you know, whether they were off campus or, or on campus and um, were more likely to report victimization at home. So those who moved back home had higher, statistically higher scores of victimization uh, during the pandemic. And so while we see an increase in alcohol use across the country as a result of the pandemic, which I know a lot of us are paying attention to, some populations and some ages in particular may have been uniquely impacted and may be dealing with the consequences of this alcohol misuse moving forward. It's important that university health centers and counseling centers are aware of these unique experiences and how they may complicate health, well-being, and academic success for some students as they return to school in the fall and get back into general university activities, which a lot of us are planning on doing here in August. So with that, I will say thank you again to Anthony for the invitation to come and speak with you all. And um, we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Fish. At this time, we will be taking questions uh, from you all. So we would love to see um, you submit questions. Please submit them now using the Q&A feature and we will ask them um, to our presenter. Dr. Fish, we do have a hard hitting question um, to start. Uh, the CAT has a very big support group uh, in the chat. And so any information you're willing to share about the CAT, like uh, if a name, uh, I think the supporters in the chat feature would much appreciated more info about your assistant who had yeah. lots to say. Yes, he did. I actually have two cats. One is more vocal than the other. His name is Nico. Um, he generally does not do that during the day. So he must have been feeling particularly sprightly this afternoon to jump in and do that. <laughs> so intentionally during the middle of my talk. So thank you all for normalizing that. It's the joys of working from home with pets and kids and all those things. Absolutely, thank you for, for entertaining us and uh, answering that question, uh, but also to just powering through it. So kudos uh, to you and thank you um, for bringing yourself to us from home. So uh, we know that there are challenges in doing that. So the first question uh, goes to back to socialization when you were talking about like just the relationships around alcohol and just the coming out process. Mm -hmm. um, so thinking about the socialization of, that is included and involved there um, in the coming out process and, and just, um, around LGBTQ life in general. So what are some of those big challenges around that socialization uh, process? And then specifically thinking about college students. So what are some of those big challenges and how do we deal with that as prevention folks? Yeah, so if you're thinking about, his, let's, let's talk about, there's a piece of history here that we have to acknowledge is that social spaces for LGBTQ people historically are rooted 
in bars, clubs, and ballrooms, right? And these are spaces where alcohol use is, is quite common, right? And so even if you yourself are not a big drinker, you find yourself in spaces where alcohol use is very normative and it can heighten perceptions of normativity around alcohol use. And therefore you might actually engage in alcohol use more than you might had you not been in those spaces. And that was just by virtue of uh, stigma and criminalization back in the 1950s, 60s and 70s that those spaces were safe in a way to meet other people. Now fast forward to today and guess what? Gay bars, I, I use that term colloquially, LGBTQ bars, clubs and ballrooms are still a vestige of that socialization piece of LGBTQ life and culture. And so what is one of the first things that people do when they come out? They go to the bar to meet other LGBTQ people to kind of be in space and in community. There is a lot of strength in that community and I don't wanna downplay that, but that does open you up then to engage in behaviors that can potentially lead to misuse and disorder drinking for those that potentially have vulnerabilities for those things. So what are some of the things that we can think about in college settings to be able to potentially stave off this kind of um, environmental cue? One of the things that a lot of youth programs are doing in communities is they are creating very intentionally youth and young adult spaces that are free from alcohol and drugs, right? So a lot of library spaces may be co-opted and used for LGBTQ meetings and times. They may have youth clubs that are alcohol free. Um, and this is not just for like youth as an under 18, but under 26. Those are like these clubs and spaces in college campuses. Most have an LGBTQ equity or resource center. Those are alcohol free spaces. But you wanna think about outside of just a service model, where can you create space in your local environment that is a space by and for young people to be able to meet and congregate and socialize. So think coffee shops or bookstores. Those historically have also been present in the LGBTQ community, but have not had the same kind of influence in culture as bars and clubs. And so you might think about how do you steer folks towards these LGBTQ affirmative spaces where they can meet other LGBTQ people, but it's free from alcohol. And that's kind of a, a roundabout way of answering that question. Hopefully I got, I got there for the person who asked it. Thank you, Dr. Fish. We do have another uh, another question. Uh, this participant would love to hear any examples of LGBTQ plus alcohol and drug prevention programming, if you're familiar with any. Yeah, so this is the million dollar question. We actually, we do not have an LGBTQ prevention science uh, like to other traditional prevention science, uh, just in terms of like a traditional prevention science sense. We really lack community and group-based programming for LGBTQ youth that is specifically tailored towards alcohol and substance use. What we have are kind of like these overarching programs and um, interventions, uh, preventive interventions that are a little either more structural or that are just kind of related to positive youth development, but not substance use specifically. So I'll give you some examples. So more structurally, we know policy, big P and little p policies, really matter for substance use for LGBTQ young people. So schools that have policies, uh, anti-bullying policies, anti-harassment policies, we know that youth who go to those schools are less likely to experience bullying and victimization and therefore less likely probably to engage in alcohol use, right? So there's this roundabout way of using policy to try and influence prevention. That also includes outcomes of suicidality and mental health. Those policies tend to be more influential on mental health and tend to be more mixed when we look at substance use. There's some studies that show that these protective policies at the state and school level are protective against uh, substance use for LGBTQ youth. Other studies find that actually LGBTQ youth are more likely to drink in environments that are more protective. And I think there's a peer influence going on in some of those studies. So generally we tend to think that policies matter and they do, um, but with some mixed evidence for alcohol use specifically. The other thing um, from a programming standpoint uh, that is relevant are just general positive youth development programs. So think about what used to be gay straight alliances, they're now gender and sexuality alliances. These are clubs and schools that are led by a teacher or volunteer um, and they're for LGBTQ youth and allies. Um, and so those kinds of programs are just related to having a safe space for LGBT youth to come to, to talk to one another, to be able to support one another, create community. 
And those types of experiences within schools are that are have been uh, statistically related to declines in alcohol use within the school, whether or not the LGBT young person in that school actually attends that GSA, just the presence of it matters. And so, um, although obviously attendance has a bigger effect. So gay straight alliances, gender and sexuality alliances, those are some really great programs. But in terms of like standardized curriculum based evidence based prevention programs for LGBTQ youth, we don't have them. They're usually almost always at the at the structural level or individual treatment. So can you as a therapist in a counseling center integrate LGBTQ specific supports that has shown to have some efficacy? But from a programming perspective, from a prevention perspective, this is kind of the new frontier for where we're at with things. And it is so incredibly important given how many young people today are identifying as LGBTQ. Thank you, Dr. Fish. That makes <clears throat> so much sense. Excuse me. And this next question goes with that a little bit. And so you were talking about the gaps and saying that there's uh, so much work to be done. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question came in about where to go next. And so I want to amend it a little bit is funding aside, right? Funding is, is not a barrier. Um, where would you start? If you had the opportunity to do brand new research in this space, uh, what would you like to see if funding wasn't an obstacle? I know exactly where I would go. So um, LGBTQ community centers and organizations have been around for decades. Traditionally in the 1980s and 90s, they were specifically for adults, particularly during the AIDS epidemic and the AIDS crisis. Um, we saw these community centers operate as mental health facilities, social supports, community gathering spaces. But as the decades have gone on, more and more of these community programs, they're nonprofits, they range from very big centers to very small centers, are very youth focused. And so we have them in a lot of major cities. In DC, we have Smile. When I lived in Austin, we had Out Youth. There are, there are over 280 registered LGBTQ centers in the country right now with a national nonprofit called Centerlink. And so these are incredibly under-resourced, under-supported <laughs> under centers who are doing incredible work in communities and are providing safe spaces for LGBTQ youth, are engaging LGBTQ youth, um, after schools and on the weekends, um, they're teaching them life skills. Some of them do tutoring, others, a lot of them do support groups. And so you can see how this kind of center culture around LGBTQ young people um, would give them kind of this lived experience and expertise on how to support these LGBTQ youth as they're navigating high school and college, right? And many of them define youth as 26 and under, so very relevant to the college student population. They are desperate for prevention and intervention. They want curriculum-based, evidence-based prevention and intervention strategies so that they can fund the work that they do. It's a circle though, right? Because we don't have those types of programs. So what they're doing is they're making up their own programs. They're seeing what works, they're checking in with youth, they're changing their approach to doing this work. They continue to do it, they learn more. And so they're iteratively creating programs in their communities specifically for the youth that they serve. Um, and so I would start with them. I can be in a I can be in a group of folks who are doing this work. I'd want to hear what they're learning, what they're doing, what's working, what's not working. And I feel like that would be the best place to start because really, it's these staff members, these executive directors at these centers who are working with these young people that have the practice based evidence to start to build this field up. That's awesome. Um, you getting excited gets me excited because I think there's a lot of potential there. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that perspective. Uh, unfortunately, that's the last question uh, that we have. So with that, just want to say thank you to you one more time. We do have a few housekeeping slides I would like to go through. If you would be able to, to advance for us real quick. So we do want to remind people again about our upcoming um, national meeting, August 2nd through the 5th. Um, so you can use the link at the bottom, heckaod.osu.edu slash national meeting um, to learn more about that and to see registration. If you have any questions, you can reach out to us um, as well. And so with that, um, that's the conclusion of the day. So Dr. Fish, thank you so very much for your time, um, for your expertise and for your passion. Uh, we so appreciate you sharing that with us. And here is our information where you can reach out to us if you have any other questions. Um, Dr. Fish, do you have any final thoughts before we log off? Yes, thank you. I'm just so grateful that you're providing a platform for this conversation. 
I feel like college, the college environment has not had a ton of LGBTQ related research um, in it. And so I'm just glad that y'all are talking about it. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for helping us elevate this space as we realized this was a gap for us. So thank you for helping us kick off as we elevate into this. So thank you all so much. We hope you have a wonderful day and a wonderful week. Take care.